Hi and welcome to Biotech's specialist webinar. Uh, we have Professor Las Comps from uh, Nancy University Hospital and from uh, Geneva University Hospital. So, without further ado, it's my pleasure to have a Professor Las Comp in the specialist webinar. Professor Las Comp, warm welcome and uh, hope that everything is going well with, with you in, in France. Thank you, Laurie, for your kind words. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, of course, everybody would prefer to have a talk face to face, uh, but uh, we are very lucky with these uh, new uh, technologies and I'm uh, happy to be with you uh, tonight. Thank you, Professor Laskomp. It's our pleasure to have you with us. Today's topic is the use of resorbable screws in pediatric traumatology. And without further ado, please, Professor Laskomp, tell us what you know and uh, start your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, the title of this talk is uh, the use of uh, resorbable screws in uh, traumatology. And um, I would say that um, each indication you have for uh, using uh, metallic screws, uh, you can use definitively resorbable screws. And of course, the big advantage is to avoid the question of remove or not remove uh, this uh, device. So as you know, I've been working in, uh, in Nancy in France, uh, working a lot of uh, elastic nails in uh, uh, long bones fracture in children and adolescents. And then I moved to uh, Geneva and continue uh, this, uh, this job. Here are my uh, disclosure. Uh, I've been president of EPOS of the French Society. I'm reviewers of uh, many reviews uh, and I'm consultant with these companies. My first experiences of resorbable screw started uh, 15 years ago. And the question was um, in OCD of the knee, of course you can save the cartilage with these uh, metallic screws, but we don't know the future of this. And you know that it's quite impossible to remove them. So I was very happy uh, to uh, realize that uh, some screws were available on the market. At that time there were fusis screws I operated 10 knees with eight excellent results, but the goal is to have 10 for 10 good results. And unfortunately, two cases had uh, temporary synovitis, which uh, a good evolution, but uh, at that time, uh, these implants were not anymore available. My second experience, with, with another uh, type of implant. It was uh, published about uh, 24 patients, uh, 15 boys and nine girls, being aged 12 uh, years old. And these lesions were 10 extraarticular fractures, 10 intraarticular fractures, mainly uh, tibial spine fractures, and four OCD. Uh, briefly, and uh, that was uh, Inion screws, uh, poor LLD, uh, with a small diameter, you see uh, the same length for each screws. And uh, very often it was necessary to put not only one screw, but sometimes two, three, or four. And definitely these screws were uh, too small. And um, the result was uh, mainly good, I would say, but in some circumstances, we had the subcutaneous mobile head screw. That means that the resorption was quite early and then the head was mobile. Uh, of course, it disappeared in two years, but uh, sometimes there are some complaints of patients. And very often when you tighten the screws, uh, you can break them and then you lose your compression and you need a second screw, a third screw and so on. Uh, for uh, intraarticular uh, tibial spines, again, mainly good results, good clinical stability, but uh, we observed uh, two niflesome and one uh, chronic uh, regional pain uh, syndrome, which, uh, and the third, yes, OCD, uh, good MRI evolution, 
two excellent results, but again, one case of effusion and temporary uh, stiffness. And you see on uh, the slide the position of a screw uh, on uh, the MRI. So at the end uh, of this series, we observed uh, one third of complication, of course, uh, not severe, no sequela, but mainly uh, some uh, inflammatory reactions, some uh, synovitis. Uh, our series was uh, quarkrit with 4%. Sorry, next please. And some uh, broken screws. So um, after these experiences, I was really ready to use new screws. And uh, that was the story with uh, Activia screw developed by uh, Biotech. Uh, I moved in Geneva at that time. And I started uh, with this uh, implants. You see that uh, many uh, diameters are available, many lengths, of course. You have uh, a cannulated screw, which is very nice and easy to use on the key wire, partially threaded, which uh, may uh, lead to an excellent compression. And uh, if you prefer, you may have non-cannulated, fully threaded screw. I will uh, present to you, uh, not present, comment uh, the video from uh, Bioretech, if I can have the video, yes. It, just to have uh, an idea of the technique, which is absolutely classic, it's exactly the same uh, you use with the metallic screw. So a few a numbers of uh, instruments. You start by uh, drilling. Of course, the diameter of the drill is a little bit less than the diameter of the screw. It's uh, very important. Yes, you measure, of course, the length. You can control uh, the length on uh, your CR because this is uh, metallic. And it's absolutely mandatory to tap uh, on uh, all the lengths to avoid any uh, tightness uh, on uh, the implant. And this countersunk is also mandatory to enlarge the hole uh, in the cortex for the screw, the head of the screw. And then you put the screw, you use an adapter with your uh, screwdriver, and with, I uh, would say, uh, two fingers uh, very gently, and uh, you tighten, you tighten, and you observe compression and compression and compression, and at the end, up the small part adapter uh, pull out, and that's finished. Don't try to continue to tighten because you have a risk to rupture um, the head. <clears throat> so this is an uh, easy technique. So I would uh, present some uh, cases uh, and um, discuss a little bit of some indication of uh, pediatric trauma. The first case was uh, a girl, 11 years of old, 11 years old, and uh, she fall in uh, gymnastic. And she came to me for a second opinion with this uh, fracture of the medial epicondyle uh, under a, a, a splint. Um, as you know, uh, this uh, fracture is an apophysial injury. This is a classical Solter 1 through uh, the physis. And uh, this is the first step of an elbow dislocation, which means that in the classification, the uh, stat 1 is uh, mainly minimally displaced, stat 2 is rotated or displaced, stat 4 is the dislocation, and Type 3 is uh, sometimes very tricky because that means that there were uh, there was a dislocation uh, spontaneously reduced and the fragment is trapped into the joint and it's very, very important to recognize this. So now the question is, uh, in this situation, uh, take care of the possibility of other injuries. Uh, you know the triad of the elbow, which associate uh, fracture of uh, the radial neck, fracture of the olecranion. And in this case, you see uh, under the red arrows that it was quite impossible to see the epicondyle avulsion because it was still uh, cartilaginous. But after uh, some months, you see that the position of this uh, epicondyle, medial epicondyle, is close to the joint. And of course, you have 
some uh, sequela. So take care of this. Now, be aware of complication because this is a step one of uh, elbow injury dislocation. You may have instability, ligaments injuries, complications are non-union, cubitus varus, hypertrophy, ulnar nerve impairment too. So the treatment can be conservative if the fragment is not displaced, but very, very often we prefer uh, an open reduction. Uh, and the question is how to fix it. Of course, if you have several fragments, uh, you can use a kind of suture or a kind of anchor, uh, and you may have a, a, a resorbable anchor or some uh, key wires or a screw, and the question is always the same. Do you need a washer or not? And of course, at the end, you always need uh, the release of the nerve, ulnar nerve, when you make the uh, reduction to avoid uh, an injury of this nerve. So when it's uh, mildly displaced, like in this case, uh, it's controversial. But for me, definitively, I would uh, fix uh, with a screw, every case of dislocated elbow, type 4, every case of entrapped, of course, every case of in elbow instability when you test it under general anesthesia. And the question of minimally displaced, sometimes a uh, surgeon discuss about 5 millimeters, but definitively I would say 4, 5, 3 millimeters for me is an indication and uh, uh, you may accept a short immobilization of three weeks only. So, and of course, the question of implant removal. So for this uh, young girl here, I decided uh, to uh, fix it. And I used this uh, resolvable screw. And I don't know if you, you, you see my arrow, but along uh, the adapter, you see uh, uh, a line, uh, which is the position of the screw, perfectly uh, located in the medial uh, column uh, on AP, on lateral, and you see the results after uh, cast removal at three weeks. And this girl was very happy to have a short immobilization because uh, she was playing uh, piano at very high level, and three months later she was able to uh, win uh, a concours uh, of piano in uh, Switzerland. And uh, after three months, she had uh, excellent function with a normal leg bow and extension, flexion and extension comparable to the opposite, and also a symmetric carrying angle. So the second case was a boy uh, five years old. He fell from uh, a tree, and you see uh, the fracture of the early cranon. But when you look at that fracture, uh, you always have to think about the position of uh, the radial head. And uh, if you uh, measure the axis of uh, the uh, radius, you see that uh, the axis doesn't cross uh, the lateral condyle. And uh, this is a dislocation of uh, the radial head, which is a Montegial lesion. It's not a Bado 1, sorry, it's a Bado 3, which is uh, posterior. Uh, so it was mandatory not only to reduce the dislocation, but also to reduce perfectly the olecranion, because if you don't reduce it, uh, you cannot have a stability of uh, your joint. So this boy was quite uh, young. Uh, I did an approach uh, by uh, posterior approach direct on the olecranion. It was easy to reduce to uh, fix it with a clamp. And uh, I started with two small screws. I uh, used a drill of two millimeters, but the 2.7 screws were too small. And then I decided uh, to uh, use 3.5 resolvable uh, screws. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, funny to see the both holes like this on the lateral. But anyway, resorption is uh, done. And after one year, uh, the function was absolutely normal. Another fracture uh, is than the distal tibia, what we call the TO fracture. It was described uh, two centuries ago by uh, this man who was a professor of surgery and anatomy. And this is the anterior uh, 
lateral uh, tuberculum of the tibia. And uh, what is uh, interesting to note is that it sees a Salter's free type, and it always appears at the end of growth uh, when the medial physis is fused, but not the lateral uh, part of the physis. Uh, sometimes the diagnosis is very difficult, and you see here a lot of uh, misdiagnoses are done uh, because it presents like a sprain of the ankle joint, but you see a fusion, you see the line of the fracture, you see the gap here, but you realize also that on the EP view, it's very, very difficult to measure exactly the distance of the gap. And this is a joint fracture, so which is important. And remember that on the lateral view, always draws a Shenton lines, and here uh, it's not perfectly uh, aligned. So it's nice to have a CT to measure perfectly the displacement. And you see that in this case, if you look on the X-ray, lateral X-ray, you see a fusion at the posterior part of uh, the uh, ankle joint. And on the CT, you see that there is a second fracture of the posterior part of the tibia, which is uh, not uh, visible on the X-ray. But anyway, this fracture is on uh, displays. So the treatment of this fracture, usually it's acceptable that displacement of less than two millimeters, I would say on the CT scan, is conservative treatment, but above two millimeters, you need a perfect reduction and a fixation. You can do it by open reduction, red, open approach, reduction and fixation with a screw. Usually it's better to have a screw strictly in the epiphysis, but because the physis is always already fused medially, it's not important if you cross uh, this uh, area. You can also use a percutaneous uh, reduction if you wish. So the example here, a girl, uh, 14 years of age, fall from a tree, she presents with this fracture. And it's not uh, to treat the physics you have to reduce, but really to treat the joint. So reduction was mandatory. And uh, then you see uh, at the end of the surgery, it's difficult to realize where is the screw. The screw is oblique. Perhaps you see on the video, on the picture on the right, the oblique screw. And it's mandatory for me to perform an arthrography at the end of surgery to be sure that the gap is absolutely uh, closed. And here you don't see any fluid into uh, the, the fracture, which means that the compression is perfect. Another example, a very simple case of this uh, medial malleus uh, fracture, which is uh, far from the physis. Uh, the gap is two millimeters, it's a joint fracture, and definitively I prefer to obtain a perfect reduction. And this is nice to see that with a short screw, 20 millimeters, uh, you avoid to cross uh, the physis because you never know what may happen. And uh, you have here uh, the tap and then the screw, and then you have a very good compression, perfect reduction. You see absolutely no fluid in the line. This is peroperative. And after a couple of months, you have a good results. And of course, uh, no uh, gross uh, disturbance. Um, another fracture of the distal tibia is uh, the fracture of the medial malleolus, uh, which is called the McFarland fracture, uh, which is a Salter type 3 or 4, and there is a right, uh, very high risk of uh, epiphysiodesis. In addition, this fracture happens uh, very often in young patients, 6, 7 years old, and you see in this case the absence of reduction lead not only to a problem of the joint, but also to epiphysial disease. Uh, you see the absence of growth of the medial malleolus and the Harris line, which is oblique, which means that step by step, you will lead to a virus uh, deformity. So reduction is absolutely mandatory. Now, this is a bimalleolar uh, fracture. It's not really well uh, observed, 
But when you realize the mechanism, very often, uh, I would say 90% of cases, you have an avulsion type 1 or type 2 uh, of the lateral uh, malleolus. And you see here on this X-ray at day 21 that there is an ossification uh, on this uh, lateral uh, malleolus. So you should realize that this is more a bimalleolar fracture than exclusively uh, medial uh, fracture. And of course, it's not always necessary to put a key wire or something like that into the fibula. But what is mandatory is to reduce the tibia and to have a screw which is strictly horizontal, parallel to the ankle joint and parallel to the physis just in uh, between. And again, at the end, controlled by arthrography or arthroscopy is depends. So I observed this case, uh, which was a dislocation of uh, the, the joint uh, with uh, both malaria uh, injured. This girl was uh, 13 years of age, fall in gymnastic, high level competition, uh, no immediate complication, but anyway, that was a severe. And then uh, immediately uh, I reduced this dislocation at the emergency uh, department under ketamine and uh, required for a CT scan to understand perfectly how it was. And you see that on the CT lateral view, there is still a dislocation of the ankle and a lot of fragment. But anyway, I decided to start uh, by uh, the fixation of the medial uh, malleolus with uh, an approach, perfect reduction. I've used uh, two uh, resorbable cannulated partially threaded screws uh, one diameter 3.5 and the second 4.5, strictly parallel to the physis. You see the drill, you see the tap, you imagine the screw in uh, this area, and uh, you see uh, the arthrogram at the end. Sometimes what is nice is to uh, put the screw into uh, the fluid, and uh, you may have a fluid around the screw which makes it visible. So here is the case of the girl after uh, seven days. You see in the lateral view the two holes of, the, of both screws. After four months, bone union, normal growth, and after uh, eight months, symmetric growth, no uh, discrepancy of both uh, legs and a full uh, recovery uh, of uh, function. That case, uh, in a boy 14 years old, again, gymnastic foot inversion, he presented a fracture of the basis of the first metatarsal bone. Not so easy to see, but again, on the AP view, if you look at the Shenton line, uh, this line is broken, and you see the fragment here. And on the oblique view, you may see the fracture which goes into uh, the joint and uh, definitely which is uh, displaced. So uh, it's uh, easier to see on the CT scan and on the plantar view on the right, on the 3D reconstruction, uh, you realize the fracture with the displacement, medial displacement of the first metatarsal bone. Uh, of course, it's not so easy to uh, reach uh, this uh, area, but anyway, by... Uh, dorsomedial uh, approach, it was uh, possible to look at that. And uh, you realize at the end with this uh, resorbable screw, 3.5 millimeters diameter, three uh, centimeters uh, long, that the fracture is perfectly reduced, perfectly reduced on all the views. You see the screw here parallel to the joint. And in this, you see just a hole uh, for uh, the, the screw on the right. Uh, this uh, imaging was possible with the new uh, 3D uh, C-arm in operating room. And uh, if you are lucky to uh, have this uh, material, it's very, very nice. And of course, it avoids uh, big irradiation like uh, O-arm, for instance. So you see all... Uh, uh, the position of the screws in the 3D position, okay? And last case uh, was a boy, nine years old. He had a 
front pollen injury, and that was the upper limb. Uh, of course, a fracture of the distal uh, radius and ulna, but a dislocation of the elbow, as you can see, and something strictly wrong on the elbow, uh, and uh, another uh, team of traumatology didn't answer uh, to the question, what is it exactly? Because if you look at the initial X-ray, you see that this is a medial uh, dislocation, which is uh, quite rare. Uh, and you ask to yourself, where is uh, the lateral condyle? And you see that uh, this uh, area is uh, empty. Sorry. <laughs> yes, here. Uh, there is nothing. And after the, the reduction of the dislocation, uh, you realize that the lateral condyle is there totally uh, displaced. So I would say that was a dislocation plus a fracture of this uh, of uh, lateral condyle. You know the, the classification of the lateral condyle. Type 1 is not displaced, type 2 is mildly displaced, and type 3 is severely displaced. So that was a type 3 plus a dislocation. Uh, and the decision was uh, to fix it. Uh, it was necessary, of course, to cross the uh, physis. And I used two resorbable cannulated uh, screws, of course, the reduction of uh, <clears throat> the wrist. And uh, after six months, you see the position of the screws and uh, a good result and a good function. But of course, we need a follow-up to be sure that there is no gross uh, disturbance. And today, I cannot uh, answer exactly to this uh, question. So I would say that the advantage of these implants are, first, there is no need for removal implant. Second, they are really strong. Uh, if you test them on a block of plastic, you will be really impressed by the capacity of compression without uh, any breakage. And compare uh, with our experience in uh, Nancy, our Geneva experience was very nice because we observed absolutely no uh, complication, <coughs> no abnormal mobility of the head due to early resorption. And perhaps it's because this head is really inside the bone uh, due to the countersink uh, system, <clears throat> no operative uh, breakage, uh, but of course you uh, tighten with the screwdriver just with two hands until the adapters pulls out, no joint effusion, no inflammatory uh, reduction. Uh, next, please. My preferences uh, between all the screws uh, are definitively cannulated screws because it's always the same. You reduce the screw, you put the key wire, and then you want to put the screw where is the key wire. So then it's easy to go on, and you see that all the instruments are uh, cannulated, partially threaded definitively to have compression, and I realized that very often I've used the 3.5 millimeters, even in the case of a boy of five years old, uh, Oli Krenen, uh, this is really a, a nice diameter, and it's very, very important again to use the countersunk uh, to make a room into the bone for the head, and probably this avoids the mobility when resorption starts. Uh, so the manipulation, you have seen uh, the video, drill the hole, use the tap with precaution, but all the lengths long, tighten with two fingers, as I mentioned, and I would say that I don't see today any disadvantages. I'm sorry, but it's true. Uh, and when when you say to the patient that uh, you are going to put a kind of resorbable implant, the parents are so happy because they realize that there will be no discussion about implant removal, which is a uh, new surgery, you know, or to keep it. Of course, we can let implants forever, but usually patients don't like to have metallic implants somewhere in their bone. So the question now uh, is uh, about indication. You have seen with the examples I presented to you that all indication for screws, metallic screws, can be used with resorbable implants. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, a lot of other fractures, for instance, if you use a key wire uh, to reduce 
uh, metaphysical fractures and you use uh, the uh, Kapunji method or other type of method, uh, you can use this uh, resorbable implant instead of a key wire. Uh, in um, orthopedy, definitively, if I have to do a pelvicostotomy, solter, or acetabuloplasty, or things like that, I will use uh, the long nails uh, to fix uh, the, the, the bone because uh, you don't need a, a lot of implants and definitively you avoid the discussion about to remove or not. Uh, now, the question of elastic nails is something different because, uh, again, it would be uh, fantastic to uh, suppress uh, metallic implant, either stainless steel or titanium. Uh, but the technique has to be improved, but I'm sure that in the short future, it would be a perfect. And uh, I would conclude uh, to say that uh, probably a lot of metallic implants you use today will disappear in the future uh, with a kind of resorbable implants. So I thank you uh, for uh, your attention. Uh, and if you wish, uh, before going back uh, to the studio uh, in Finland, I'll kind of answer to some uh, question I, I received, uh, Laurie, if you accept. The one question was uh, one or two cortex. I would say it's the same with a metallic screw. Uh, if you decide two uh, cortices, use the two. But very often, it's spongious, cancellous bone, uh, one cortex is enough, but it's exactly the same with a metallic implant. Regarding the postoperative follow-up, is there any change uh, compared with metallic? I would say no. You saw uh, my series; it's exactly the same. You, if you if you if you want to check after uh, the cast removal uh, uh, at three months, at six months, control the growth. It's exactly the same. How close to the physis? Uh, you have seen the example of the medial malleolus. Uh, I think that you can stop one millimeter uh, close to the physis. That's it. Uh, now the question is, can we cross or not? I think that we, we, we need some uh, further studies, uh, some cases to answer to this question. But honestly, uh, if you imagine a bridge of just three millimeters uh, and remaining growth, we know that this bridge will break, and we have a lot of examples with metallic implants. Uh, so probably uh, it will be uh, 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 compatible with this kind of treatment. Uh, lower age limit. I would say the lower age limit is uh, the limit you have with your patient. As soon as you decide for a reduction and a fixation with a screw or a metallic implant, you can uh, move to a uh, resorbable. The question of imaging during surgery, of course, you, you really want to, to, to know where is your screw. You know where was the drill, you know where was the tap, uh, but anyway, it's nice. So a good thing is you dip it into the contrast fluid, so there is some contrast fluid around the screw, and under your C arm, you really know the position of the screw. The quality of uh, the image I show you is quite difficult because they are taken from the, the, the C arm, but you, you, you really see not the screw, but the periphery of the screw and the position where you are. Uh, what is the most difficult indication? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, the, the most difficult is the most difficult uh, type of, uh, of fracture. Uh, probably a, a difficult fracture is a uh, lateral condyle because of the humerus, because you need a perfect reduction. And of course, I didn't talk about supracondylar, but definitely uh, when uh, you reduce and you fix a supracondylar with uh, two or three key wires, you can change your mind and use uh, some resorbable implant. Uh, yes, it... Um, you have uh, other questions, I will be very happy to answer to this. Professor Lascombe, thank you very much for sharing the presentation and answering these questions that we had in advance. Thank you very much and thank you for the questions, they were, they were excellent. Uh, we also had a few questions during the presentation. Uh, how long, Professor Lascombe, uh, on your opinion, how long is the learning curve 
for those surgeons who are switching or trying to use uh, bioresorbables and now are using only metal implants, the conventional method? I would say um, the, the most important thing is that surgeons should be convinced that this type of screws are solid and can obtain a compression. Laurie, you, you had uh, a video uh, which showed, I didn't find it again, which shows the, the possibility to compress a plastic part and you have a model uh, and you have to, to show that to the surgeons and they tighten, they tighten, they compress and they realize that it's very, very strong without any breakage. Uh, second thing is that at the end, when the adapter uh, pulls out, never continue to tighten. It's done, you have your compression and that's it. So if you accept this, I would say that there is no learning curve. Of course, you can have a, a problem and change uh, uh, and need a second screw, uh, which was, was not expected. But you can put a screw so uh, it's metallic, it's resorbable, it's the same. Perfect. Thank you for this answer. Uh, another question was, uh, as you cannot see the screw, uh, how do you de determine that the screw is in the correct place in your indication? What do you look, what do you look at? The, the drill is in the correct position. The tap is in the correct position. The screw cannot go somewhere else. I mean, so it would go in the correct position. You know the length, you know the position. Now to help you, because you need really to know, uh, as I mentioned, dip the screw into the fluid contrast. And then there is some fluid around the screw and you can check uh, the position of the screw on your screen. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. But mainly, mainly the message is that you take the x-ray in a different position with the drill or, or with, the, with the tapper. So prior, prior yeah. the insertion. Okay. Uh, and, uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, yes. sorry. Another thing you can do, uh, I just uh, think about that, is uh, when you use a cannulated screw, you can inject the fluid inside the canal which gives you also the position of the screw and the length. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, then there was one question for the number uh, two case, the olecranon fracture. Uh, what made you choose the screw 3.5 in that uh, indication? Uh, you're, you're right. The, the boy was young, so I started with a 2.7. Uh, Perhaps I had a problem because I drilled with the two millimeters drill. Then I tap with the 2.7. I cross both cortices, of course. And then when I use my 2.7 screw, for unknown reason, but perhaps the screw is too small or uh, the cancellous bone was too weak, and then I lost the compression effect. So uh, I decide to stop with this kind of screw. I remove it, and uh, in the same hole, doing nothing else, I uh, place the 3.5, and then I obtain the good compression. But I think that uh, the opposite part of the bone was definitely too small. I would say not enough, enough long to, to obtain the compression. That was probably the reason of the building. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Professor Lascombe.